So we'll get started, and this is just a really casual uh, thing. We had an opportunity, well, first I'm Heather Stafford with um, Executive Director of Sustainable Valley Technology Group. We work with small businesses um, in a variety of fields here in Southern Oregon. And our, our mission is really always kind of two things, is to get them excellent mentoring and to also get them access to the right kind of money. So mentoring and money kind of go hand in hand, and, uh, and the more vehicles, the more avenues uh, that they have, that especially small startup companies have, the better. So this is um, Amy Pearl. She's uh, visiting us from Portland. She's the executive director of a company called Hatch, and that's a social incubator, 13,000 square foot incubator in Northeast Portland. And it's almost celebrating its year anniversary. And this was truly a statewide collaboration. Um, Amy was the driving force and Hatch uh, to make this law happen. Uh, I want to call it a law, this rule. This is not a law, that's a rule. It's about, we'll get into all of that here very shortly. Um, but it's a very, very big opportunity for Oregon and one that we're excited to share with you. And actually, this is one of the very first places in the state that um, you're the first ones to sort of receive this information because it's not even been approved yet. So this is your very first movers uh, on this information. So it's a pleasure to have you all here. I see lots of faces I recognize, so thank you so much. And um, I'll let Amy take it away. Oh, and the, the last half an hour, uh, Lori Harris Hancock is a business and securities attorney. Uh, she's in Sisters, so she'll be calling in for the last 30 minutes. So if you, if there's anything that you are, you know, any pressing issues that you'd love an actual securities attorney to answer, she'll be on the phone for the, from 4.30 to 5 to answer all of that stuff for you. Even though we probably know it inside and out as well, but, you know, she's she's the credible one with a lot of you, so <laughs> we'll let her play when you're on TV a lot. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, we actually have been around for 10 years, although we launched Hatch the Incubator less than a year ago. So we're a nonprofit, actually, um, and our focus is on enabling citizens to launch enterprises that improve communities. So we are intentional about the kinds of folks we incubate and the kinds of organizations, businesses that we help. And that includes social enterprises, so businesses that have launched and intentionally uh, become incorporated in order to solve some sort of social or environmental problem, and those who are locally owned retaining capital in the community. So, uh, so there are lots of lots to talk about about all of this and how we ended up here. Um, I have a degree in teaching, uh, first degree is in anthropology, and um, my second degree is in teaching, master's in teaching. Um, I've been running this nonprofit for ten years. Before that, I worked at Intel as uh, the educator who ran the website for thirty-two countries. Before that, I worked at a research lab, and before that, I worked in the school district of Hillsborough. So, no law degree. No financial degree, no financial experience, no law experience. But turns out it's not a barrier to writing law in Oregon, which is kind of interesting to discover. So what we're going to do is talk about something that um, is actually, it may in fact be done today, as far as um, the rules that will be considered a final draft, and that will then go public around December third, open for public comment, and then there will be a rewriting based on those comments, and it will become law by the first week of January 2015. So I don't know how many of you have made a law happen in seven months, <laughs> but I understand it's rather unusual. So it's uh, something to be uh, proud of and um, very nervous about. So I'm going around the state trying to explain and raise awareness about what this means and the opportunity for Oregon. So, um, how many of you are ecosystem builders who help people in the business community or you are a community leader of some kind? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, okay. How many of you are entrepreneurs? You're looking for a way to raise capital, okay? And how many of you just want to invest in your local community? All the hands should go up. <laughs> okay. All right, good. Well, so I'm introducing uh, something called a community public offering. So what I'm going to do today is um, try to do a little tap dancing to make this interesting um, because it's, it's actually fraught with a lot of legal stuff that you have to learn, and that's part of something you just have to deal with and do and get over it and then benefit by it. So let's go to the next.
next slide as soon as I see. Um, the short history of this, uh, I'll tell you briefly because I think it's interesting. What the opportunity is, what we intend to be doing around the state, and then um, we'll talk about what this law means. So we'll just next. We intended to go through the legislative process, gather a statewide team, small business development centers, economic development districts, local incubators, um, looked for people around the state. We've read all of these laws. There are 13 in the country. They are intrastate laws. And we have the benefit of being able to look at all the other states and make what we believe is the best one. But Texas also believes they have the best one, uh, so we'll see who wins. <laughs> Does everyone understand what interstate means versus interstate? Is there any intra means within your own state borders? Yeah, it is actually something I assume people understand. But okay. So this is just kind of an interesting, so that you know, um, we did intend to go through the legislative process. Representative Reed from Beaverton area in uh, Portland Metro was going to be the um, chief sponsor. His staff attended all of our uh, meetings. And, um, and then we decided to go work with the regulators and talk to these guys who are DIFCUS, Department of Finance and uh, Corporate Securities. I walked into a room, and they all walked in. <laughs> four guys, look, someone's yeah. giggling. See, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> four guys that sat down, and they look at me, and the oldest one leans back. So, why do you think we need this now? And after an hour and a half, they were saying, you know, we should make this look really, really good for work. <laughs> so it was a fun hour. Um, I'm kind of, it was, a, it was an interesting hour. But they, uh, after having conversations with, among themselves, getting my draft, I actually um, I wrote the thing. Uh, after getting my draft, which was written like a rule, or like a, a law, I had also sent it ahead to Tobias, who would then move forward it on to the Legislative Council. They called me down to Salem and said, you know what, we've been talking to all the legislators, <coughs> a bunch of legislators, they're going to vote for it. We're not going to go through that process. It's long, it's messy. And so we're just going to make it rules. Which I had no, I, I didn't understand what that meant. I said, what does that mean? And they said, that means it's going to be live and legal by January 1st. And I said, well, of what year? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? So, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be ready to go in four months. So, um, preparing a state and every citizen in the state and all the small businesses, of which there are 80, they comprise 87% of all the businesses in our state. To take advantage of something is not a small task. It has never, ever been legal in Oregon, ever. So it's kind of a big deal. Uh, so I'm glad you're here. The rules will be up for public comment December 3rd publicly. You may actually go in person to comment on them. And they will then be live till the 10th at 5 o'clock when all comments will be assembled. And then the administrator will write the final, 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 assuming nothing earth-shattering happens between now and then. And it will look something like I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Uh, and then it will become law by the first week of January 2015. Okay, next. There are some big things to start with. This is a legal mechanism for entrepreneurs to raise capital from your neighbors. So the first part that's really important to note is that it's legal. The second part is that ordinary Oregonians actually can potentially receive the benefit of investing. So instead of all of your money being in the local bank, which maybe is a good thing for the most part, but your savings account is earning you what? Mm -hmm. Point zero, one, <laughs> five. You might make way go to three percent, five percent. Um, or your money's in, in the stock market. So um, this way, we bring capital back into uh, our state. Entrepreneurs drive the deal. This is also very confusing to entrepreneurs. 
because what they normally do are they're given a form from the bank to say, here's the deal, you fill this out, take it or leave it. Or an angel, here's the deal, <laughs> this is the way you're going to get this capital, take it or leave it. In this case, entrepreneurs decide the kind of offering that they believe is best for their business, that they believe is best for them, that they are comfortable doing, and that meets their needs. Most entrepreneurs in the room are like, no. Yes. I'm much more interested in investing in a business that actually got to decide the kind of capital they need, the right amount, the right terms, rather than um, someone who's told what they can get and how they can get it. The technical service providers in the state are involved in this law. So the small business development centers, economic development districts, the statewide networks who uh, work with small businesses um, are named actually in these rules in addition to nonprofit incubators and anyone that the administrator decides to approve. So we've left that open in case there are other situations, and there are um, conditions in, in particular regional organizations who may in fact also want to be involved. And what that means is that they will be um, an entrepreneur in order to use these rules has to meet in person with their local technical service provider. So makes sure that they're real people, which is an investor protection, and engages them with experts who can then help them review the business plan and so on. So I have yet to meet a technical service provider who understands anything about security. So this is going to be a bit of a lift this year in getting people to understand how to be helpful. So in our area, is that so ready or sustainable valley? Yes. Or mobile? Yes. Yes. And Heather Stafford has been on our team since the beginning and representing um, you guys down here in Southern Oregon. I don't know if you've ever had a talk, she represents you really well. So, um, and this is my favorite data point. Uh, I, I, I spilled the beans here, so you get the number, but um, we did some research on savings, national savings. There's five different categories that are um, uh, assessed, five different age groups and from like 35, 35, 45, 45, chunks of, of age groups, and how much you in that age group have saved on average. So there's a national statistic. So if you take that statistic, put it into the Oregon age groups, and extrapolate, you see what they can do. 1% of that number is $915 million. Which is a really big a really big number. It's almost a billion dollars. So if I just said to you, because there's like some of you are maybe going, my brain is going to lose all of her money. Oh my God. The world will end. I have actually had that said to me a couple of times. Um, just one percent. If we just said, look, Oregon, let's just consider putting one percent into the local community. We would be looking outside the state for employees. Half a percent. <laughs> okay, half a percent. So just so you know, just because we're Oregon and we're a darn rural state, it doesn't mean there isn't a great deal of money that's available in the market. Okay? Questions so far? Okay. Well, um, back to the service providers, mm -hmm. do they uh, have any liability? Is there some contract? Do they have to stand by the firm? Or do they just check off the it's a good question. Um, this is a bit of a, you know, there's there's about a hundred bird walks out of this discussion. They are not considered material participants. Um, they're working on the exact language. The idea is that they will do what they already do. They do quite a bit of business plan review. Um, part of this started out as a way to strengthen community connections to those experts. It also made the litigators happy that you would know that they were a real person. Uh, that helps. And um, that they're local is that, you know, come on, Joe, Joe, you're not ready for this. Take the workshop down the street. It's next month. You need to take it. Then you come back and let's talk. But Joe doesn't have to listen to you. He can do this. So we'd like that to at least have as many contacts as possible. So they do this well. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Uh, you can't avoid anybody getting sued. That's another thing to learn. But can't you make it so they can't be sued? No. People sue people for any different reasons. And there's no way to hip it a suit. But you can, and the regulators and the litigators, since they're on the team, can actually help, um, are making sure that this is as um, without risk for those folks. Okay, next. Um, what we're trying to do as a statewide team, we have, a, we have four teams to, um, actually that are being pulled together now. One of them is to help other organizations comply with the exemption. Talk about. We also want to build a really strong frequently asked question. So there's, there's a question, for example, I'm an Oregon winery. I sell to an Oregon distributor. That distributor sells outside the state. Is that okay? And the answer is? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Surprised me. So we'll talk about why that surprised me. Um, so there's things like that that question, people are asking really good questions that are not answered in the law that we want to be sure we can get those out there, you know, like, proactively instead of reactively. Um, how many of you know what a security is? Can you tell me what a security is? Yes? Are you? You with the hand up. Shane, make Shane do it. <laughs> Shane, okay. you're on. What's a security? What? So it's like a security from an investment standpoint it would be a piece of paper certificate saying that you have a piece of something of interest and treat of value. So like a security of a publicly traded company, let's say Nike is an example from our own backyard. You could buy one of their shares of stock and that's... That's, that's an example? Mm -hmm. That's an example of a security? Can you define what a security is? Probably not. I used to be a teacher. It's just really hard to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> a, teacher a, right, a right to something. Mm -hmm. A right to something. Whether it be part of the company or a financial right to something. That's an interesting um, a stab at it. Yeah, you're on the right track. <laughs> there is an actual definition, and of course there's a state definition, okay. and then there's a federal definition. It's an investment vehicle that has certain guidelines and regulations. It's a good try. <laughs> is a bank loan a security? Yeah, if you yeah. sell it. No. Mortgage-backed securities? It's a bank loan that you get from uh, your local bank. You go to the bank, and um, if it's fully collateralized, it's not secure. They're at they're in no they're in risk, right? There really is no risk. So a security is defined by two things, just because it's fun to tell you about all these nerdy things. Um, one is that you give somebody money, and you intend to get a financial return above and beyond what it is you gave them in, in return. And two that you are not responsible for that work. Someone else is taking on uh, the job of making you that. So you are essentially putting your money at risk because someone else is now responsible for providing you with some kind of return. That's a security. I can send you the Howie test if you want me to send it to you. But it matters. It's interesting. It actually begins to matter. Okay, so, um, if people are going to be helping others figure out securities, a debt note is a security. Most debt between people is not uh, fully collateralized. There may be some on my horse, but you know, can't pay back, whatever. Um, and then that is a security. Okay, and we also need to be doing statewide training, so we're gonna be working with organizations across the state and developing curriculum to help them be able to serve entrepreneurs um, well, as well as be able to help them through with three-hour workshops on various kinds of things, so. Okay. Next, yes, where are we? Not happening? No, um, this is not a law, as I said. Law is made by statute. Statutes come out, and then they go to rulemaking. This will not ever be a statute. The reason that matters, and that the administrator was sort of cool on, keen on this, is because they're easily changed. So getting this right is actually going to matter. So it doesn't work well, do we have problems? They will kill it or change it. 
much harder to do that if it's gone through the legislative process. So it is law, it is just not a law. Apparently it doesn't matter. Next. That's interesting. Okay. So we did what's the security. What's crowdfunding? <laughs> She's on it today. She's my straight A student. Why don't you get back in the room? It's going out to the public and basically getting the public to gift in gift into your business in exchange for some tchotchke of some sort and thereby raise money. So again, that's a, an example of crowdfunding. That is Kickstarter or Indiegogo or a number of other tools that are out there. That is what you would consider donation-based crowdfunding. Crowdfunding itself is just a mechanism, right? It's just a process. Lots of little. Okay, you're spreading the need out among a lot of people so that you can raise a lot of money. Okay. In other words, you have lots of givers slash investors slash right, whatever. So the mechanism of crowdfunding means you're spreading the risk in this particular case. You're not going to invest a whole lot. Okay, um, you all know there is a difference between state and federal laws. We're, we're experiencing a lot of this here in the Northwest with, um, and we have actually for many years, always pushing um, our, the, the law around Iran and all those things right now. Um, that's why this is an intrastate law, which is allowed by federal law. As long as it stays within your state, all of your investors are Oregon residents. Every single one of them must be an Oregon resident, and they have to prove it. And at least 80% of your assets and income come from within the state. Hence the case of wine. Interesting. Pitch fests. We see that all the time. Turns out, actually not really legal. Various folks kind of turn a blind eye. Oh, those are all people with lots of shirts. If they lose a few, nobody cares. But general solicitation is illegal in most cases. There are a few um, exemptions that are So advertising to the world, how do you know? How, you know, oh, I'm going to do this exemption, but I don't get to tell anybody. Wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So this rule allows you to publicize your offer. Okay. okay, so these are the basics. And if you want to refer to that little handout I gave you, I think it's probably not in the same order, but you can ensure that I don't um, leave something out. So this is considered, and this is a good way to talk about this, is considered security crowdfunding. Not equity crowdfunding. Okay. It includes equity crowdfunding. But community source capital, Kiva Zip, or Kickstarter, or Indiegogo are not security. Okay. Even Kiva Zip, where you provide a loan, but you don't get any interest back. So you don't expect to make any money above the principal. So it's not security, it's not regulated. So this over here is alternative capital, wonderful, great new strategies for raising capital. This over here is real, playing with the big boys, and going to make our ability to engage in our local economy legal. So entrepreneurs can raise it. Yeah, go ahead. Is it, question? Is, it, is it loan or is it ownership? You can do any kind of security from debt. Or I can teach you a new word I had to learn, which is absurd. I insist on putting it in the rules, so I'm going to teach it to you, which is debenture. What? You just they can't help themselves, you know. It's just, it's just say it again. It just debenture. Debenture. It's like debt, only if you mess with the word. So debenture is essentially an unsecured loan. So many of these will be debentures. It's not pronounced. Debenture, it's pronounced debenture. Yeah. Well, then, um, maybe I'm not understanding it correctly. Right. Um, Jeff, what was your question again about? Can they be loans? Well, there was 
a loan. It's, so it's not a loan, it's a debenture. But the person who, if I want to invest, um, there's obviously there's never a, a, a guaranteed return on that. But are you saying really it's just a loan? It's not a. It's not an equity interest. It's not a. They're both it, securities. Okay. You probably will not have a fully collateralized loan, and so it will be a security. So, the a security is a loan to equity convertible notes, royalty types, dividends. Yeah. There are hundreds of ways of structuring so, security deals. So it'll be up to the entrepreneur Correct. to structure. Okay. You will buy a note of some kind with all kinds of term possibilities, or you will buy a share, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Can we ask other questions or sure. no? You know. Yeah. So no. what what happens if the Oregon business um, begins to exceed, um, they're, they're now trading out of the area. Right now, they need to do 80% of their revenue right. from Oregon. So yeah. what happens if they're a growing business, which is everybody's goal, mm -hmm. and they begin to trade out of the area? Is there some kind of an exit, or what happens? Well, um, it's a good question. We have someone we're working with now that's a software company, and they have decided, because they really want to do this, uh, Oregon first, they want to use this exemption, they're going to restrict their sales across the state. So strategically, they're going to say, we're just working with Oregon first. Fine. 80% um, is pretty healthy, actually. 20% of outside the states are actually pretty good. Uh, this is Rule 147, which is the safe harbor. So it gives you a little bit of wiggle room. Um, the idea is that it's citizens in within a state investing in companies within a state. Now, after 12 months, which is the maximum, although you can actually extend it another 12 months. But let's say you say, you know, you raise the capital you need um, in six months close it, you take down your advertising, just like any other security raise, you have to wait about six months, uh, and then you can do whatever you want. So you need to comply with the exemption while you are using it, but can extend and expand and do all sorts of wonderful mm -hmm. things after. Yeah. How does that relate to web-based company? Yeah. A good question. It's, um, Eighty percent of your sales have to come within the, from within the state. Okay. So you mentioned a winery if they're selling to a distributor. If the distributor is selling all over the country by giving you the check, do those sales technically come from Oregon? They give you the check when they buy all your wine. So and they're an Oregon distributor. So technically, you are selling to an Oregon business. All your your customer is an Oregon-based distributor. Even if they're selling throughout the country. Correct. So you can't predict what will happen to the perfume you sell at the local Saturday market. It might be sold to your Aunt Mary in Virginia. You don't care. You don't have to. It's a bit of a trick. I know. I'm just kind of excited here. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You were not. So I want to make sure I understand. Um, we have a 12 month window. Yeah. We sell within Oregon and let's say we're wildly successful, we close our offering in three months. We have to wait another nine months before Six. we start selling more than 20% outside of Oregon uh, or 12 months. Um, that's a good question. You know, uh, how long do you have to wait before you expand and exceed 20%, I don't know. It won't be long. Okay. It, it, six months is an, is an industry standard. It's a safe harbor for, for securities offerings. So if you do rate one raise and then you want to do another raise, you usually have to wait six months. I don't think it will be, I mean, it certainly wouldn't be longer than six months, but I will find out. Okay. I should have that answer. Even if we stop after three months, then it's basically like a nine-month period before we can yeah. potentially sell. Yeah, the 12 months is just a maximum. Is it, in other words, okay. when you, when you, uh, okay. when you qualify for the exemption, you submit your materials to the director by sending them copies of your offering document and such. Um, you have, the exemption allows you uh, 12 months without having to do anything else. Now, if you close it, you can send, you send the administrator, the director, a letter and say, done, pretty excited, you made our raise, 
can take down your public um, advertising and send the report into the state, and then you're done. Okay, and then my next question would be, can we do additional rounds or raises? And six what's months. Every six Very months, young. if you wanted? Well, six months <laughs> between raises. Okay. This is sort of the general securities thing anyway. You can't combine exemptions, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what we're working on them with, so we're trying to make it streamlined a little bit easier, but really it's a six-month pad, and Lori can talk about this too, which she calls in later, but six-month pad on either side of whatever race. So if you went and won an angel conference, and two months later you wanted to do this, and it was for the same thing, that you can't do it. So you have to choose, right? If you're getting angel money right now, you have to wait six months after you've received that angel money to do a raise like this. And you would have to disclose that, of course, in your in your documents. Okay. Also, the purchaser, the investor in your company, um, has to hold that note or piece of equity or share for nine months. So it is truly needs to stay within Oregon. So it's an, a, another safe harbor thing that's put in there for the investor side. So you can't just there's no trade, there's no big stock market going on for these kind of securities. You Yet. buy it, you sit on it. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> Hold it. on to that idea. Yeah. What if you got a, a large investment from an angel, uh, totally independent of these ter of terms that you were offering in the crowdfunding, and then a couple months later ha had this crowdfunding on the heels of it? You would have to wait six months between. Between, between any It's rate. very typical, yeah. Now you can, this is why Heather and the, the, the folks that you are um, going to uh, talk to, these particular questions that are sort of much more one-offs, will be really helpful. And, and you can um, send a letter to Jason, I can tell you who to send it to, and say you want, would like a waiver. Because it's kind of like, come on, really? I just got one angel guy. You know, I wanted to, can I do this in two months? Do I really have to wait for six? And you probably would get it. Because like, there there's are lots little, of things. Yeah, there's lots of things to do. If you if you borrowed from an angel ten thousand dollars to build your website and do a couple of things, and then you needed two hundred thousand dollars to actually build a commercial kitchen, which has not <coughs> really anything, it's not the same offering, then waivers and other things are kind of possible. Yeah. I'm being recorded, so I'll stop talking now. Yeah. <laughs> Just to clarify, compared to other forms of uh, crowdfunding. This is where investors will get returns, right? Guaranteed, or not guaranteed, but returns. It is a securities-based crowdfunding, yes. And it is only allowable state by state currently. The Jobs Act, Title III of the Jobs Act, uh, was intended to create the state, the National Crowdfunding Act is part of, that was the big deal, right? Big thing, the big, big excitement that Senator Murphy's staff actually helped craft Title III. And then the Securities and Exchange Commission people all fought, quit because they were terrified. And, and so they're still in rulemaking right now and um, are stalled. Yeah. So I'm hanging in with Senator Murphy's office locally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just met with Andy two weeks ago or two months ago, I guess. But yeah. now he's gone. You and lost he's him. He's gone. Yeah. Dang. But we well, will find someone so who was place. very good with yeah. Andy. Um, so one of the Senator Murphy's big concerns was the protection of the investor. So um, I see you have two thousand dollar cap per deal, but then somebody can do as many deals as they want. Yes, and I also and their see husband and wife can do it, so they can lose up to four thousand dollars. Okay, yes. and also even kids. Can you define that a little bit more? You know what? I can't. That was a surprise to me. Apparently, as student, you know, children, kids can actually hold securities because you buy them. Eighteen. What kid is? I actually. The I sort of just stayed away from the conversation because they said we would. Because people buy securities on the stock market now. Uh, so I actually don't have a lot of clarity around that. But teenagers, so for example, they talked about school students and schools can actually invest. So I, I will get more clarity around. Um, the reason that this law won't actually govern that is because there's other law that governs various things. So contract law and other sorts of things that they, they all kind of nodded their heads and said, oh yeah, of course, we're not worried about that. And I thought, okay, I didn't really have, I don't have a strong answer for that. But there's a lot of interest in that. They think that that has um, possibilities for, you know, sort of kids learning how to use the stock, how to use the investment. And is, is 2000, I, I, I don't have, 
real thumbs, but two thousand. Well, how did you come up with two thousand dollars per piece? Well, uh, we didn't. We actually came up with five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Every other state, except for Maryland, which I think doesn't count because Maryland is doing something odd. They're doing debt only, hundred dollar shares. I mean, um, notes only, and you can only raise a hundred thousand dollars. They're doing something unique. Um, two other states, Washington State being one of them, unfortunately, because we keep looking to Washington as if they did it right, which they didn't. Uh, they basically copied Title III of the Jobs Act. So it has, if you make $100,000, you can do this much. If you make more than $100,000, you can do $200,000. And then you can do this much. It's like, no, we're not doing it. I don't want people to have to check. I don't want to give anybody my, w, my, my tax returns. We're not doing that. So um, we asked for five. We um, negotiated. And David said, I can sleep at night if they lose $2,000. $2,000 is the, it's incredibly low. It's very, very low. We, we thought maybe we'll get them up to $2,500. It's, it's quite low, the investor protections here. And these are guys who spent their entire lives truly protecting. So we're pretty comfortable with that. Yeah. But you have no, um, no requirement on how many deals they can do? I guess part of the no. question then is, when you do a deal, is there any, does anybody else know besides you and who you do the deal with? Like now, is your name on some, some does, some, does somebody know that you now do this? No. You do some crowdfunding and so they can come after you and try to get, no. Right. So you said that you, the Washington rules mimic the federal jobs act rules? Yeah, so, he just copied the Jobs Act Title III. This, he did this two years ago. Now he, I think, regrets it. So, but how are the federal rules put together? Are they, is it, does it allow states to do up to what the federal rules allow? Or does it say states can do their own thing, or what? Right, so this is where you have to kind of grok this. It's my new word. <laughs> federal government has exemptions, states, have exemptions, you pick the one you want to use, and then you use that one. So if I wanted to use this, this exemption, these rules in Oregon, I would not be able to use the federal exemption because then I would be layering exemptions. So they have different requirements, just like there are a lot of exemptions you could use to raise money, the new 506C, where you could publicize, but you could only accept accredited investors. There's a lot of things people just don't have any, just don't know about. They, they will uh, not work together at the same time, but you certainly could do one and then the other, just like you could do one wait a time period and do another of any kind of exception. Okay, does that help? I know. Does that make sense? We don't know what the federal is because they're stuck. No. Yeah. But this federal has authorized it, and they have some particular, they have some guidelines, or some side okay, so or frames. <laughs> Um, so let me back up. This is, so, in the Securities and Exchange Commission, you can go to sec.gov, SEC my new favorite place. Um, that's not actually what it is. Um, and you can look up, it is actually 3A11. And when I was looking at 3A11, guess what I discovered? 501C3. And I went, oh, 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 I get it. So the federal exemptions provide for all kinds of things, including nonprofit exemptions. And 3A11 is an intrastate exemption. And that's where it spells out exactly what states can do, so long as they meet the federal conditions. So we're just, it's the same thing. The Constitution and the federal guidelines create national law, but there are lots of places where if it's just within your state, it's in trustee commerce, and you don't break our laws, the feds, mothership, you can do quite a range of things. That's why all the state's laws look different. Okay? Yeah. Um, you said there are 13 states that yeah, have created an intrastate mm -hmm. funding mechanism like this. What, what kind of deals have they? Um, what kind of deals have they done? Oh, um, there's one in Michigan that was a a brew pub, and they raised, I think, about a half a million, maybe more. Um, there have been, I think, maybe two brew pubs. <laughs> you know, I have a list of them, and some of them actually didn't know what they were. They're uh, all really new.
So I can I could probably list all of the states if you want to jot them down. Michigan is actually creating a um, intrastate stock market, a stock exchange. So we're going to really watch Michigan. Very exciting. So Washington. So some of the early ones: Alabama, Kansas, Vermont. We copied some language from Vermont. Um, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin. Texas, Tennessee, Maine. Yeah, one more. So, what about uh, fees? Um, I mean, obviously, legal fees. Do you have sort of uh, legal aids that are helping to put the paperwork together? And then, what about marketing? Is there some sort of state website where all this is promoted. So do you think the state should do a website? All in favor? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess not. <laughs> no, not going to happen. That's a relief. Yeah, so, so yeah, you know, whatever you feel, however you feel about it. It's crowdfunding. I, I really can't explain this. This is, this is something that is so as astonishing, really. Um, so, we, our, our nonprofit has had a, a website up called Change Exchange Northwest. And our intent, three years ago, was to help people do a different kind of interest state offering called direct public offering, mm -hmm. as well as um, get accredited investors investing in impact and investment deals. So we have a website that has a map and shows opportunities around Washington and Oregon. We have taken all the content, or a lot of the content, off because we're switching to something called HatchOregon.com. So you have to be, um, the website in the rules say, you may publicize your offerings on a website. That website may not make any money, and it may charge a nominal flat fee. So I don't know anybody who would want to do that except for a crazy nonprofit. So we intend to do this because the focus here is education, and we're an educational nonprofit. So there will be a website, I think, um, that will at the very least be able to publicize the deals where they are, and we'll be able to look at the um, at the uh, offering documents, and that will be HatchOregon.com. Is there any fee then associated with the whole deal? So we may charge a fee to put you up there. Um, it will be nominal flat, and um, so maybe you know 100 bucks or something. I don't know. I'm sure that this will cost even. Um, so here's a question. Employers who charge $250 an hour, at least, are confused. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know how to help. Right? In a way, they're like, so they want to raise $25,000 and they want me to help them? How am I going to help them? I can't help them. I don't make any money. So there's this whole market that's going to need to be filled. Not just for legal and securities help. I mean, some of what we intend to do in terms of filling that gap is training every consultant and every business, you know, anyone who's, who works with small business to understand this, to teach about what's true. So educate. Advising is a whole different world. Um, and some lawyers are thinking about how they might be able to help people arrive at the right kinds of decisions about the kinds of securities to offer. But I have a question. Who's going to teach you and your next door neighbor and your mom and your dad and your kids how to look at an offering document and do due diligence? Hmm. Is there a requirement that you want to know? No. How many of you are married, ever bought a car, ever bought a house? <laughs> We've it's all done due diligence. So not that complicated. I believe this is going to be the coolest thing that ever hit this country. It is going to transform the way we think about our money and the way we look at our economies. So how do you visualize this rolling out? Or is Hatch going to be a conduit for? Yes, we have lots of visualization things happening. Okay, so I just had questions. Anybody want to just one little answer though for you, Melissa? There is a two hundred dollar fee. Yeah, that's the state I did mention. There's no, like with the DPO, you have to get audited financial statements and all this stuff, and it costs twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars just to do one. You can raise up to a million dollars. This two hundred dollars fee, you register, you go. Actually, they're not registered. You 
submit. Sweet. When I wrote this, I made it $100, but they, uh, they doubled it to $2 and I decided not to argue with them. All right, let's go next. Uh, there's a little bit more. So I think we've covered everything. You can sell these after nine, I'm holding them for nine months. Um, what does that mean? Who can you sell them to? Um, there are exemptions that cover that, and we don't, I don't, I don't actually know enough about this. You can sell them back, um, but you can sell them to others in particular kinds of circumstances. So just go with that. Uh, we already know you can only be selling to Oregon um, residents. You can live in a car. I don't care. So long as you live in Oregon. Number three is essential, amazing, is that you are allowed to publicize your offering. It is limited. You can say that you're doing an offering, the name of your company, who you are, how much you're raising, the time period, and probably the type of deal. It will say something like inequity or as a loan. Um, you could put it on a CSA box, so long as all your boxes were going to your customers for staying in the market. You put it on a t-shirt, put it on a billboard, you put it in the paper. Put it in the newspaper. Yes. So imagine, five years from now, you and your family are sitting around on Sunday morning at the breakfast table. And you say, oh, come on, you guys, I don't want to go garage sailing today. Let's go look at the local investments in town. <laughs> <laughs> and you can. That's awesome. <laughs> Isn't it? It's just, it gives me goosebumps every time I tell that silly story. Um, you'll be doing uh, biannual reporting, providing reporting um, of the condition of your business to your um, investors. <coughs> Five and six refer mostly to um, service providers. In the uh, requirements that need to be filed, a copy that need to be filed with the state, and that you will include in your offering documents, you need to include the minimum you must raise, even though it's not your maximum. You try to raise $100,000, but your minimum is, I really, really, really have to raise $30,000. If I don't raise 30000 I can't buy that thing, which I really need to even do anything. Therefore, I will give you the money back, let's say. You could do something like that. They're not requiring escrow. This will be interesting to watch. So that you have to say, this is a minimum, this is my maximum, and explain what you will do if you don't reach your minimum. Which is new for entrepreneurs. They don't normally think that, but it's best practice, and so that's going to increase the kinds of skills that entrepreneurs will have to have. You also have to talk about facts and material to the offering. So that means what's really going to influence the benefit and what's really going to influence um, what the risks are. <coughs> Ma'am? Amy? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Could I go back to, to the, the minimum, 2,000? I got the impression I've heard from what you said. That's a cap. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> we wish. Yeah. That, um, I infer from what you said that other states had a higher, and uh, maybe based on the experience of other states and experience in Oregon, is that possibly, a, can that be amended or, or raised within a fair, fair bit of time? Yes. I mean, because- It's something that's on the table still. We've, we've been tussling about it for a couple of months. It, it, just the very fact that even if you only have to report twice a year, um, the cost, of reporting in any meaningful fashion and the burden of also maybe taking phone calls in the meantime um, to set a min a maximum of 2,000 is just it's a bit it, um, it's, it's sophomoric at best in its grade school I'm sorry well you should the, come down to the state they will I can tell you right now I do world. not think they'll go above $2,500 he just won't do it right it's his gut this is this is the guy who's in charge and Has he ever been in the securities um, business? He called it the World Wide Web, if that tells you anything. So, so we have, you know, it's like, and he spent 40 years protecting citizens. So right now, uh, this is why I'm standing in front of you on my own time, saying we need to do this right and we need to do this well. And then I think um, they will have data by which to raise it. Now, your other point, people don't call. This is something I keep asking people across the state, across the country. So do, are you hounded by your investors? And they're like, if only. 
These are people who are your best customers, your best fans. They do not call to tell you what to do with your business. Um, and the reporting is pretty straightforward, and you can do it digitally. So you can post it and be done. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Next. Can I, can I ask about the reporting? Sure. Because so, I get confused by the term sometimes. Biannual. You said biannual. Annual. You mean twice a, twice a year. So semi-annual. Okay. You should have said that. That was what they wrote in my five. And what type of things are required? Um, condition of the business, um, any where the money has gone, especially if it's gone to pay salaries, to what degree you have increased anyone's um, salary who are um, you know influential with the company. Basically, it's how are you doing. So it's actually it, it just it says you like P and Ls or like uh, uh, financial statements, but like would be also. Narrative. You could also look up what IPO companies do, public companies. They do annual reports as well, and they do quarterly reports. Quarter well, quarterly reports. Almost all states. states. I mean, ask some quarterly reports. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it spells it out. But there will be. Will there be a standard, or does each um, business owner, when they do the offering, say, "This is what I'm going to report." Yeah. So think of yourself as this fellow who is in charge of this regulation. <coughs> Who doesn't want to regulate any of it? He just wants this, these rules to be elegant, safe, clear. So anything that he would actually have to regulate, he, he doesn't want to put in there. So um, there will be a form for reporting at the end of your raise. He thinks he's going to create a form, and there probably will be forms. Somebody will make them, they'll put them up there, and we'll create them. But there is no standard, particular standard form. So what question on our rules? Um, are they? Uh just developed by this person, this individual, in this, in this um, division, uh, I assume it's DAS, or maybe it's, it's another It's DIFCAS, Department of Finance and Corporate Security, DF. It's Department, though, of what agency? You work for the... State, state right, Department. Right, Amy? the governor. Great. Well, he's with the governor, so I would say it's the governor. He's the governor. Yeah, you don't work for business or he's probably and they don't work for I'm guessing it's the Department of Administrative Services and it's a or is it its own agency? Well when I got there I said, Do you guys work for the treasurer? And they said, No, we work for the government. Well yeah, all agencies work for the government. So in this um, my question is the it's rules. Is there a commission that's gonna adopt the rules or is it staff that's writing these themselves? Is there a commission? So the administrator, most people ask me, can they do that? When I say the administrator, they, they write these administrative rules and the regulatories can do this. And I said, so people, I everyone asks the same question. They say, can you do this? So, but um, I'm sure they're there. <laughs> I'm sure they're there. <laughs> I'm sure they're there. <laughs> I'm just curious, if it's a if it is a commission, <laughs> oftentimes <laughs> they have a local representative. It says it's part of the Department of Consumer and Business Services. That's okay, it's DCPS. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Okay. So, that's the that division of that department. Yes. Um, so the question is, yeah, does, they can is the do commission this. adopting the rules or not? That would be good enough, just if you're interested in influencing the, the yeah. rules. The day, the in-person day is December 3rd, that much I do know, and then um, you will be able to provide letters and email, I expect, and, and a feedback and calls, probably. Um, uh, the deadline for that is December, 5th, December 10th. Uh, this has definitely not just been written by them, as I said. We met as a statewide team for you know, a number of months, read everything. Uh, the fact that I wrote it because I used to be an English teacher, right? So plus I was the only one you know, who wasn't in the room at the time, probably. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it was kind of fun. It was actually, it was very interesting. Um, so then a woman named Erin Tiberbo took it on. She was assigned to do that in that department, and she has then been the person shepherding it through the process. Real, real quick before we go to the next slide, the, yeah. uh, the uh, semi-annual reporting, what's the purpose of the additional reporting? After, as an investor, after I sink my 2000 in, uh, the after I put $2,000 in investment, I'm holding a unsecured security. Perform. So what's what is reporting that information give me? It doesn't give me. How does that empower me as a, as a consumer? It's accountability. 
it's something they feel is important, but as an investor, that you keep track of your investment and know how it's doing. And in some cases, you may have voting rights, depending on the type of entity. So there is, there is potential recourse uh, within the unsecured, within the parameters of the it's unsecured. It's not that it's unsecured. Assessment. I mean, all equity is, I would say, you know, this is, it's a, you're, equity is a very different kind of thing, obviously, than debt. So right. one, one will be a note, and the other will be, gosh, I hope everything goes well. Or you may be getting dividends if they do well, or royalties. It depends on, on the terms of the deal. So it's about accountability. It isn't as if you need to potentially um, make a decision. But it is about keeping you apprised. They were very clear about that. We uh, Most of the states have quarterly reporting. They just adopted what's sort of typical. And we said, we're not making small business owners report quarterly. That's absurd. So um, we said uh, twice a year. And in fact, I wish I had said annually. Well, yeah, we have to do taxes annually, so I mean, I, I can go with annual. Yeah. Right now, and but both sides, it's been interesting who believes what's good. Some people are very interested in what's good for the entrepreneur, right? It's, it's best practice. They should know how to do this. And so that semi annual uh, reporting is going to stay in there, I think. Yeah. I may have missed this because I didn't come in late, forgive me, but. Um, in a more traditional public offering, there is the scrutiny of investment bankers, et cetera, to properly value this business. So if I'm buying $250,000 of XYZ, who is giving me an fairness opinion or whatever other terminology to determine that this $250,000 is buying 10% of something that probably isn't worth $50,000 without the $250,000. Who is coming up with the determination that these individual investors are getting a fair percentage of the equity? If you're selling equity, you've got to be buying a percent of something, of course, a whole, and who's determining what the value of that whole is? Because in, in a typical IPO, that would be done by the bankers who are then going to sell that to their clients, so they're effectively responsible for that proper valuation of the whole or the pro performa whole after the money raise. Mm -hmm. Because the whole is going to be worth more after the money's raised. So, you know what I'm saying? I mean, how, yes, how is that, this gentleman's question here in the sense, what's his security? His security is he owns 1% of this entity. Well, is, is that fair or is that a... It will be up to him to decide, won't it? It, there is no entity, in fact, many people in the securities world, broker-dealers, people who are from and work in the stock market will tell you that valuation is also a bit of a crapshoot already. Well, sure. So the, at this stage, with these numbers, the answer is that the businesses themselves and potentially with legal support and other uh, uh, you know, um, indicators of value will be used and they will have to put those in the offering documents and the investor will, will examine them. But there is no entity uh, that will be valuing these companies. Or no no requirement no for fairness of them. Or, or a third party appraisal. There's no vetting of these, though. Okay. And that's why the cap is $2,000. That's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> now we yeah. yeah, so it goes back to your I'm interested in the household. Well, it could be higher if you had kids and parents are investing with kids. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could put 14000 in. It's not, I mean, it's the spirit of the law and the, and the intent of the law. The, 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 the um, uh, letter of the law. The intent of this law is to provide opportunities for, for citizens to engage in their economy within reason. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about the statistics of what is happening with small business funding now, it is a pretty serious uh, situation. So um, bank funding is down 34% to 48%, um, depending on whether you're a business, small business or micro business. Um, and the sense that citizens in our communities can't make decisions with $2,000 feels a bit paternalistic. So they're taking. Uh, a chance on us and saying, we think you guys can handle this. And given that 
I've been in the room with you know these litigators who've been doing nothing but but suing people you know uh, for 40 years. The fact that they're pretty comfortable with this makes me feel mm. kind of okay about it. I think it's a great. I think it's. Your, I mean, commend you and your team for putting this together and moving forward. And I think it's creating all of my mind's going through a lot of thoughts. And I go back to the entrepreneurs hat in the business, small business. Then I go back to the consumer. And being a banker in, in this market for 15 years, it scares me how many people still fall for the Nigerian oil scam and how many people <laughs> fall for the rent <laughs> scam. And, and then in our community, how many people. $2,000 is, is their life savings. How many people that, 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 I, that I see coming in and out through my doors that don't physically have $2,000 in their savings account it blows my mind. Um, and so I'm trying to balance going back and forth. And I appreciate uh, Berkeley's office here and, and their uh, you know, thoughts in the consumer protection. And I don't know what the answer is because I'm also dealing with the Consumer Protection Agency, you know, the CPF, CFP, and the rules that they have in place in the banking is making it really difficult for us. Yeah, you guys are having a hard time. It is, so it's, well, it's kind of a So the way they put this to me was um, they think, and I, you know, it's, if anybody thinks the stock market is safe, raise your hand. Right? <laughs> Come on. So, so, you know, we're really, we're, and if you've read, you know, Flash Boys or if you have any sense of what's happening um, at the national level, things are they're very interesting across the board. The question here is, if you get a phone call from someone and they sound desperate, or an email from someone and they say, send me your whatever, and you do, that is not going to happen here. <laughs> yeah. It simply can't. You have to sign something. I mean, the protections, the process of getting engaged with an investment is actually pretty substantial. You're either going to be, um, even if you do it online, you have to read something, you have to check it, you have to um, demonstrate, type in something that you're actually already resident. There are a number of things that have to happen that give you pause, that sort of force you to stop. And one of the things we're planning to do is to do a video of the legend. So you know the legend that's in the, if you read anything in your, secure, in your investments, the very bottom usually is a teeny tiny print. Mm -hmm. Basically it says you're an idiot to engage in this, you know, you're going to lose it all. So we're going to do it with real people and read it to them. And say, well, you, you listen to this video, you're not going to be able to go past it. So we're going to, you know, do a rest. Yeah. I just want to share per personally a little bit because uh, I have a 17 year old son. Cash the car. We're going to buy a new car for him, right? But we're probably only going to spend $2,000, $3,000 on this new car. It's kind of a big deal for our family to make this choice. I'm going to hire maybe somebody to come check out the car and get the advice of my, my father in law kind of thing to say, is this a good car? And, you know, things happen. It could the next day after we buy this 20-year-old car. <laughs> but, you know, I think there's things that are comparable of it, but because it's this investment, we put it in this other category, but we deal with stuff on this level all the time. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I have a um, concern that there's not enough, um, certainly locally here, business resources to support. The entrepreneurs, because I I I um, participated in the Southern Oregon Angel Network for the past few years, and our problem is not lack of capital; yeah. it's lack of good deals. Right. We get a lot of applications, yes. but the number of deals that are deal ready are, are, are pathetic. I know. And 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 on top of that, this each one of those deals is enormously risky still. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned that you you may be solving part of the problem trying to create more capital here, but unless there's the resource to actually develop the entrepreneurs, I don't think you're going to get anywhere. Well, I think um, this is a much bigger question. If this law and, and these, these rules were not on the table, the same would still be true. So what, what you're talking about is something that um, is a symptom of something else. And I actually, um, I think that that I'm being recorded and probably ought not to tell you what I think. Um, I think it's a problem and I think we need to uh, come up with um, some what might even be considered uh, questions for our government, say. Um, what do these folks do? Where does the money come from? Why, if, if we, why aren't there more workshops? Why aren't there more appropriate resource, resources for our small business? They, are 87% of the businesses in our state. They create our communities. They make us decide where we want to live. 
Why are they failing? And why do they not, why do they not seem terribly well organized? And so part of this is intentional in terms of just if you want to raise capital, you need to improve your practice a bit, mm -hmm. theoretically. Um, but I think that these two are, uh, while related, um, the other is why I'm standing in front of you as an ex fourth grade teacher and the capital access team of the Small Business Development Center is not. Yeah, I, I'm still concerned that the problem is not lack of capital. I, I, I wish there were many more companies that overwhelm us with desires for funding yeah. rather than how do you get these people into shape to actually really move a business forward. I mean, that, that's my experience mm -hmm. just locally in this region. Now in Portland, I'm sure you no. may, it may no. be awesome. They may not be true entrepreneurs. Said, it, really the problem is, um, is the type of business we're talking about. So it is, it's, it's really most of the people who will be taking advantage of this law will not be interesting to angels at all. They're just not that kind of business. They're never going to provide an exit. They are building communities, but not um, 10x deals. They're just not, uh, for the most part, going to be. So that in a way, they're, we're actually trying to fill a gap that other um, finance, financing events and situations uh, currently, though, struggle often to find good deals. But they're, they really, it's just really almost a different, for the most part, many of these businesses that use this level will be a different kind of business. So you're saying you may be filling in where? Bank loans might have built in yes. a few years ago. Oh, that's yes. a little that's a little different. Yes. But yes. this is a deal flow part. I mean, working down here in Southern Oregon, going into our fifth year as a, um, a sustainable valley, as a, an accelerator, um, I think statewide and also locally, business acceleration and business development is becoming a third prong to economic development and workforce development. I mean, I think the state, everyone's eyes are aha, it's, it's this preventative healthcare type of economic development. You know, building on your strengths, developing early businesses, but we're just a little, it's, it's, it's um, ecosystem building, like you said in the beginning, and it takes time, unfortunately, to inspire your 10th grader or 12th grader to start their own business and they don't graduate for two more years. And so, you know, we've also, that effort to build a better pipeline of businesses is starting, but it's just, we're just now starting to see a little bit of critical mass happen, and there's just so much that entrepreneurs need to know. This is not easy. This is very, very complicated stuff. So is taking angel money, so is doing a, a bank loan. I mean, they have to get a lot of things together, you know, business plans, marketing plans, finances. You know, they have to really know what they're doing and not, you know, they're not business majors. Yeah, well, that's exactly I mean, my concern. Yeah, that we yeah. don't have the resources to do that. I think we're building, I feel positive about building them, and I see more <coughs> incubators and accelerators and things coming online all the time, and that's actually exciting. I mean, it's just, you know, we're, we're working hard. Yeah, I actually don't have a, I don't have a really, you know, I think um, what's happening here, what Heather's doing, um, that hopefully, because now uh, the emphasis is on the big company with the big exit, at, at the most, right? There are places where they put money in, they put a lot of mentoring and resources around so that you will make money for an angel. I think, you know, that there's an incentive, more of an incentive there. But what the hope is, is that this will create an additional incentive for other kinds of entrepreneurs to, to have more. Well, I think it would be helpful to really define the, the market that you're looking for in terms of entrepreneurs. I mean, if you're talking about you've got a business in town already and it needs some additional capital, but it's extremely risky that a bank would have loan in it, that's a very different target. And in which case, you need to define your target and then make sure your rules really apply to that particular target. Well, we did, uh, actually. And so um, I may have neglected to say that up front, but that, uh, the target, that is why we were comfortable with the cap of $250,000 raise because of the data around that above that is a number that's a little bit easier to access, but the under $250,000, and in fact, we believe most of them will be under $100,000. So it really is a, it's a smaller, um, it's a smaller amount of money that will probably be needed by a great number of people. So it's, it's a very good point. Yeah, Next. Just, just to give you a snapshot, we're representing the Small Business Development Center. And we have many clients that are in this program called Dream Savers, where it's, uh, it encourages them to learn about financial literacy. They can save up to $3,000, and then because of this grant, they get matched three to one, which is nice. Is it an IDA? Yes. Is okay. Yeah. Individual yeah. development account. Individual accounts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they qualify, 
they have to take, we offer workshops. They're required to take those workshops. They're required to meet with a business advisor and write a business plan. So I'm just giving you some real life experience over the years that the ones that participate and they get the money, so they put in 3,000, they get the, the match. And typically they use the money for marketing. They want to hire somebody to build them a website. They want to buy a new computer or a new printer. And that's the majority of the Dream Savers people. I'm just trying to think about our clients over the years and how they might use this. Yes, access to capital is very important. My opinion is there will be people that if they even got the money, they wouldn't even know what to do with it. And I just wonder how, you know, what would be in their best interest and how would the investors benefit? So are you saying your job description just changed? <laughs> <laughs> I need some training though. Yes, you do. So on the fourteenth, come to Portland. We're doing a training. Um, I know about that yes, training. So I'm I'm inserting myself into as many things as I possibly can. So it just you're right. And the small business development centers and the economic development districts of which there are twelve in the, in the state are really the the network. They are who small businesses turn to. And maybe that network will double in size. So I don't know. But that is a network that needs to be. You know, like kind of ready. Yeah. Is there a maximum number of investors? Uh, depends on the entity. So an S corp is 99. An LLC is probably best for notes. And uh, C corp uh, is 500 maximum if you're worth 10 million dollars. And then you become, if the minute you hit 500 investors, if you're also worth 10 million dollars, then you have to go public and do an IPO. What about the no, notes? How many, $10 million. how many note holders can you have on your LLC? Is there a minimum, maximum? No. no. It's just that equity for LLCs, people don't like LLCs for well, It's cap. Was it capped at 250000 total of? Uh, 250000 is the amount you can raise collectively. Collectively. So if everyone contributed 2000 you could, you could set a number of people. But it could there. be. Unless, it would know, be like, sort of set for you. Yeah, <laughs> 198,000 yeah. if you did escort. But right. I mean, you have to. You know, these are you have to work it out. Is like, is there any room in here? I haven't heard it mentioned. I would have thought it would have been negatively mentioned. But is there any room in here for an agent, somebody no. to intermediate? No. no. So this broker is, dealers are actually intentionally. Uh, they, first of all, they won't touch it. They well, no, 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 no. I wasn't thinking of a conventional broker dealer, but someone who had, you know, like one of the several of the folks in here, some way be compensated to bring, uh, in other words, it's direct sales only. Direct sales is securities. There's no way to have intermediation, no, no way to have an agent relationship in any way. Well, I think that, that the agent is, is an intermediary to selling is one thing, but uh, the market for the need, to fill the need of entrepreneurial expertise, to teach citizens how to engage in their economy, all those sorts of things, that market is wide open. Because this is new, there is no, uh, there really isn't much, there's some, but isn't a, it isn't a strong ecosystem as he's pointed out and as we're aware. But in terms of, it is a direct, it is, it is, a, it is a direct, has to be a direct uh, offering. So is your vision to not only have it a website, because I think you said Patch is going to have a website that could potentially kind of be like a Kickstarter, but it's really an organ, so it's not really, but it's, I mean, <laughs> don't say it's like Kickstarter. Okay, but it, I mean, it's the same theory other than it's a security and it's not a gifting, so it's the same sort of thing, but then also I'm assuming there's a large percentage that's going to be community-based that is going to be stemming from the avenues, you know, the Sustainable Valley is already here those groups here locally to be able to do their own and be facilitated? I mean, what is the vision? Do their own. Do, well, how do, you, how do you get the word out? I mean, you just like put something in the paper and say, here, I'm here. I'm here. Or well, how do you visualize yes. most of this coming together? Yeah. And having, well, it depends, having obviously, on your happens. business. You know, if you sell beer to your, you know, if you, so you put on labels. Or uh, it depends. I don't know. It depends on the business, right? Okay. And then um, we want, visibility is really important. So ultimately, we're hoping that, you know, the Oregonian will have a section where you can put it. Yeah. You know, or um, a website, Patch Oregon, is something we're going to do and are doing, and you'll be able to find them on the map. 
Um, there will be, we're hoping that there'll be regional nodes, so you can actually go to your local whatever, your regional whatever, and see, oh, you know, an expanded version of the map, and you can get a little better sense of who is nearby. Um, we want people to invest across the state to look at things. Oh, I love Joseph or the Wallows. Oh, I love that place. Oh, that's that pub. Oh my gosh, I could be an investor in the pub. Terminal Gravity, Enterprise, right, whatever. So, I mean, um, I have a vision for all sorts of things because I think that we're, um, that, that while accidents will happen, right? Things are going to happen that we kind of maybe wish they didn't happen, probably. Um, they won't be to expect. And I think the smarter we get, the better off we're going to be. So, um, I think it's a, an opportunity for us. And I hope we do rise to the occasion. No. Now, you said that other states have done it. Any length of time? So what, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot after January 15th, you know, bad and good. But have there been some good experiences in other states that we can learn from in terms of how they've done it? Yeah. Have, has their entrepreneurial activity increased? More businesses, more jobs? What have you seen? Yeah, nothing yet. I mean, it's just it's too early. Um, again, Texas is, and, and most of the time they get all excited because they pass the law, and then it goes into rulemaking where it just dies a slow death in some cases, right? It takes a long time sometimes for the rulemakers to wonder what the heck just happened and landed in their lap. In fact, I don't even know if Washington State is up yet, um, and it was signed into law June 12. Um, there are lots of interesting things going on around the state. We're going to hold a conference May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd uh, called CONCAP. You know, why not? Comcap US, and we will be inviting a number of people are coming who are leading and have led those state initiatives. So we're going to be talking to state folks, economic development, regional folks, and um, regulators from around the country, and educators looking at well, how do how did this work? How do we make this work? We know it can, it could work. Um, so that's next. Yeah. Same thing. What is in California? Uh, they're working on it. In fact, I've got a friend who's working on it as well. Is California is special. Is there a name of it? Or is it attached to? It? No. <laughs> I, mean, I, I wish. Hatch, or, hatch, hatch California. I know, that would there, truly make me find my I know. Is there, any, is there a name for it? Most of them, I mean, rules don't even have names. I had to, I, you know, we sort of, come on, you guys. Put in that little lovely preamble. Um, I read this little thing that, that kind of a compilation of some of the other states and the laws they name, you know, the Something Act. Um, so we cleverly originally called it the Oregon ROI, relocalize our investing. Uh, they weren't having that though. But I said, listen, we have to decide, you know, it has to be differentiated from the direct public offering in which you fill out the score form and you can raise up to a million dollars. We have to call it something, what's before a DPO, a CPO, community public offering, and that stuck. It's actually so that if I looked up in California, possibly I could No. And they'll call it that. They'll call it something intrustate. Something intrustate, would be my guess. They're crap. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understood there's no state entity monitoring the whole operation here. How do you measure whether you're successful or not? Well, um, certainly the, the um, companies will go up and the companies, uh, you know, publicly, and then they will and their raise and um, likely announce whether or not they there will be some sort of information probably shared as there typically is in like Tombstone. Um, but the state is keeping copies of everything and they will, the state regulators, DIFCUS will be keeping copies oh, of so everything. Oh, so the state is copied on the, re the yes. report. Oh, yes. The okay. filing, you must file a copy of your um, offering documents and a report at the end. So they're very interested in, in documenting how But that's the report at the end of the initial oh, period great. of funding. Not, so initially? Not two years out how the company is now performing, which is what you really need to know. They can't, yeah, they can't. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think you need more measurements in the system. This is you where don't we know hope. if you're successful or not. Yeah, this oh, is where we hope people will get very inspired and mm -hmm. want to start measuring this because there's things that are obvious. To there's but no, right now there's they, things, they so. won't do it because the regulators only do certain things, you know. But uh, in terms of will Business Oregon do something to identify where it works out or Somebody will does universities do? <laughs> sure, I think probably. An activity will. without a measurement is not a useful activity. Um, one of the points here, it's, it's somewhat mandated that the person, the issuer, must meet in person with a local business service provider. Um, will there, 
can you, what is your vision of the expectations of local service providers in terms of? We defined it. We actually defined it in the rules. Okay. So it, it identifies the, the, the small business development centers by name and where you are defined in the rules. The economic development districts, also defined by rules, and nonprofit uh, incubators. And then they um, resisted sort of a generic description uh, and said, and uh, anyone the administrator approves. So they left it that open in that way. Okay. Would, would there be any? Thing that we as service providers will need to know beyond what we generally do now? In and my will opinion, you yes. Okay. And who's going to, who will train us? Um, I'm not sure. Who will train us? Okay. I will, to some degree. Noah is on the team. So we will So the small business development centers are very on deck. You just are getting it from me instead of from him. Okay. But, um, the 14th and the 15th, so I'm offering a class in the morning on the Saturday following that 14th for three hours in Hatch to just do stuff with me. But um, it's a you know it's a question, right? And Mark and Michael have to figure out. And so I don't know exactly where it will land. Okay. And um, they're still testing with that. Yeah. Well, working with those uh, service providers, would the filing company uh, ever use some? tech, some narratives from the service provider somehow vetting the market or the product or the business in their documents that they file? Um, I mean, so ah, in other words, so if, if investors read, oh, the Small Business Development Center said there's a good market, this is a good company, it's right here in their documents, would that kind of thing ever happen? Uh, I think it would be number six. So what you will be doing as, an, as a business is you will be stating the facts that are material to the success, relevant to the uh, impact and the success of the offer. So well, if you have research... Those, those, the, the, uh, the statement of those facts coming from the service provider? Yeah. They would, you wouldn't do that. Most, most service providers wouldn't do it and it wouldn't be recommended that they would do that. You would want the facts to be able to provide, provide evidence, but you wouldn't want it to say, yeah, Joe and Mary said it's a good idea. <laughs> so wouldn't there be a tendency for, for uh, you know, entrepreneurs to, to want to use some third party, especially a uh, sanctioned state business developer or incubator or something like that? There may be say, a tendency. Yeah, tell their friends hey, it's, yeah, it um, seems like there would be a tendency for that to happen. And then, then the service provider would be liable for You know, I'm not sure, it's very hard to predict exactly what might end up in these offering documents, all kinds of things perhaps. Um, but the Small Business Development Center will have a chance to review these materials, um, and hopefully that that uh, review will provide some measure of advice, which is what they do now. So, um, uh, we will be working with entrepreneurs around the state and helping them figure out what they should and shouldn't put in these. But that's an interesting point. I would be quite confident that the SPA will do everything it can to indemnify us from anything. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Mike, when I sat on the phone initially when we sat um, and talked about this, he said, you know, we're not going to sign anything. And it's not a smart idea that they do. The only thing that, and there's a difference between signing off vetting and signing off and saying, I looked at his business plans, he was here. Yeah, it gets into all sorts of other areas of law. I've been talk doing a lot of talking. Lori's about to, let's yeah. just turn one more, one more, let's see what else there is, if there's anything. Um, yeah, these are some things that implications for your work, this is the slide set that the small business development centers will be getting. Um, what, is, what do these sorts of things mean, ultimately, will be coming to you? And it's not, you know, again, this isn't brain surgery, but um, you'll have some new words to learn about and play with. Um, tax consultants, CPAs, other folks are going to be brought in as well to help answer questions. They're going to be on that and kind of excited about that. Um, let's change the list. We have a dozen businesses right now around the state who are interested in using this law that we live. And we're working with them with a bunch of uh, free pro bono marketing, securities, lawyers, a bunch of people wanting this to um, go across the state and, and do and as an example, example, we 
going to use a giant billboard in Portland to announce this. Um, January 22nd will be a statewide party for all the businesses, those businesses who are going to use it. That will be the first time-ish, right around January 22nd, um, when anyone in Oregon can actually buy security from a small business. Very exciting. Um, we're going to have Comcap Oregon in March. I don't have the date yet. That will be specifically for small businesses and service providers in Oregon. And then in May, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, this will be a national kind of conference. And uh, I'm an educator. I've written curriculum for 20 years. My intent is to do at least my uh, utmost, because I have I'm kind of excited about this, some good materials that you'll be able to access and use either through your local folks or through our website or like whatever. question. So I'm also an educator. I teach at Ashland High School. Oh, great. And um, I would be really interested as you're developing this, if you keep, and you just mentioned you're a curriculum developer, if you keep us in mind, because I'm working with Heather and Junior Achievement to try to um, work with these kids on business plans and entrepreneurship. And so this is really new information, and I just, I, I would like to figure out a way to stay in the loop. Sure. And, you know, I, so I, I found out about this through Heather and anyways, well, I don't know how to. You know, sorry, a bit um, remiss here, but um, I'll put this up here. You would put your name and email, I'll stick it up here by the front, and uh, I'll keep you posted. Great. And if you put your name and email here, you may be one of the very first to actually get the law, the rules. Um, because, just you know, if I to. can get to these kids now, by the yep. time this really gets up and running, Who else I mean, it's be pretty, pretty exciting. What about business schools? Net Impact is on deck. This is our chance, right? Let's do this right. Yeah, there's all kinds of risks, but they're pretty, you know, I mean, the guys we had in the room who were really, really, really dead set against any kind of, even this discussion, came around after talking for an hour and began to see the possibilities. So I think that, um, you know, there are plenty of people to talk to who uh, are very, who, who have seen it all, and they actually are comfortable with this. So I think, um, you know, we've done our best. Bankers, what do you guys think? Terrify you or pre-banking? Uh, no. uh, like, I, I, I run a business not saying no, and so we'll hire myself to use that quite a bit. So I just actually took notes today for two, two guys I had talked to a week ago that were right. doing a screen printing shirt business. They need some money up front for a printer. Uh, some pretty neat stuff that they could do that I as a company would use their services. Yes, so my mind spends a lot from that standpoint with the opportunities. My mind spends a lot about the customer at the end of the day, and every, probably everybody in this room is comfortable investing in and, and understanding risks, rewards, and my fear, and my little fear with the consumer is the 0.15% that we're paying in, in savings versus the potential uh, of this 2%. promise. <laughs> yeah, whatever this promise is. My $500 is gonna make 2%. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's betting that. Like, I, I mean, I've had customers close their account, drive across town to reopen another bank account to spend two hours doing that to, to earn an extra 25 cents a year annually on their savings, you know? And that's the only option they have. Uh, yeah. Right? I mean, if you could, you know, it's, you don't have to spend $2,000, you guys. It's just the cap. Most of the shares will be less than that, right? It's like, I, I don't know, I could buy a share for $500 or... Yeah, there, there's an unbelievable gap know. between someone starting a business and being bankable. Um, yes, definitely. There's a huge gap Oh, wait, can you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> wow, Lori, I don't know where she is. Can you hear me, though? Oh, good. We can see you. Hey, Lori, you are yes. like 12 feet wide. <laughs> <laughs> no, not wide. <laughs> oh, no, not wide. <laughs> Sorry, that's not quite what I meant. Go ahead and say that. Can I see you guys, or is that, does that not work? Um... Maybe turn we're on my around. laptop and it's going to be kind of difficult. But can we give it a try? Do sign up to 
Tell me who you are and I'll keep you posted. That's your role. I should have had you do that for you. Like, Sorry, I am one of those. Can you turn the laptop around? Okay, let's try this.
You know, they're, they're going to need to, and I think this is what SPDC or Sustainable Valley can help them with, is they're going to need to kind of plan what kind of money am I going to need over the next couple of years? When am I going to need it? And what am I going to use it for? And then they look at these different exemptions and pick out which one they're going to use because, um, you know, if you're selling a security, it either has to be registered or it has to be exempt. There's a number of exemptions you can use in Oregon. Um, and if you offer, if you do different offerings too close together under the securities laws, those will get integrated into one offering and you'll have <coughs> one exemption that covers everything. So I think the entrepreneurs will do, you know, hopefully do a couple of your plan with their business plan and they'll address that, you know, when do I want to, <coughs> how much to finance my company. Yeah, Tori. Uh, so a promissory note, you know, a loan to an entrepreneur is a pretty easy, simple, straightforward document. You can pretty much get everything at one page. Um, Equity share, though, is a completely different animal. Um, how how uh, how simple could you could an entrepreneur uh, make an equity share legal document under this under this uh, exemption? exemption? Uh, how how simple could it be, and how much would that cost in for an attorney to write up or can they do it without an attorney? I mean, is it possible to write a simple uh, uh, equity share um, that would meet this exemption? That I, uh, I think that's probably not the right question. Um, a note is simple, but a note is also not a security, so it doesn't come under the securities laws. Unless, of course, somehow you're you're going to share in the profits, you know, that's the way you're getting paid back. But a simple note that doesn't give you any opportunity to share those future profits without doing any work, that isn't a security. It doesn't even have to have this exemption. It doesn't come under the securities laws. But once you come under the securities laws, um, you have an obligation. There's an anti-fraud provision which covers any securities offering. And it says you have to, as the entrepreneur, disclose all material information that that investor needs in order to make an informed decision. And so that's kind of up to the entrepreneur. I mean, if you're a really early stage, you've just started out, there might not be that much information, right? There's your business plan and what you think you're going to do. If you've got some history, then there's probably more information. There's your contracts, you know, there's your financials, you know, it just it gets bigger. But it's very, um, uh, particular to the particular entrepreneur in their situation. Lori, can you talk for a second? A question came up earlier about valuation, and um, could you just talk about that for a second? Why we're not doing that, and maybe what the verbal note is? Well, like company valuation. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that this exemption doesn't allow you to do that because if you sell. If you sell a you know one unit of stock in your company, you somehow had to figure out a value for it, right? In order to figure out what that was worth. What a convertible note generally does is it doesn't set that value until later. So it works well for an entrepreneur that's starting out because you really don't want your company valued right at the very beginning because you would have to give up a large amount of your you know ownership interest in your company um, if it was early on. But valuation itself, I can give a question to Kim. She's good at valuation. <laughs> I, I think what I, what I took out of that and what kind of what Lori's saying is this is still securities law. And this is a, a, a law that, that's lowering the threshold, but you still have the same issues that you have at any point in time if you go out to, the, to your friends and family or anybody and say, my company's worth $10 million and I have done a little bit of due diligence to make it worth that, I could, you know, I feel comfortable not getting, having un, uh, you know, a wrongful you know, valuation lawsuit for my shareholders. I could stick with that and, um, and sell convertible notes and or shares, and it's the same situation you can do with this offering. I mean, it's this, this new way of looking at it. You still have the same exposure of valuing your company implied either too high or too low if you were going to value it uh, and do equity instead of a convertible note. Yeah, I think the 
beauty of this this new exemption, and you've probably already talked about this, is that it lets you advertise a little bit, so it lets you get the word out, and then it lets you take in, you know, quite a number of people can invest in your company. <coughs> so if you're looking, if your your business is something that wants to grow customers, or you know, you're looking to create this base, this is this is your crowdfunding option. This is this is the way to do it. But if you can get on Kickstarter and get people to give you that money as a donation. one of the um, earlier uh, guidelines is that your investors need to live in Oregon, I got that, um, but that they also need to have 80% of their income. Not the investors, sorry. the company. The oh, the company. Yeah. Okay, so Our investors have, <coughs> okay. I'm like, what? <laughs> no, Thank no, no, you no. for clarifying. The investors just need to be uh, Oregon residents, but the entrepreneurs, 80% uh, the of their sales. Their Oregon business. Right. Got it. So 80% of their customers or their assets and income is how it's written. Thank you. Yes, sorry. And the reason for that is because whenever you sell a security, you have to find an exemption at the federal level and at the state level, unless you're just selling within the state. Because the, the federal government doesn't care as long as you stick within the state. So there's something called an interstate exemption where the feds don't care. Like That's what you're trying to fit this one underneath. So, Lori, then if um, a year later, then all of a sudden I have um, a, a lower, I start going out of the state more, now I have 50% of my income out of the state, is that okay? Or what is the period of time that I, that after I do the offering or close the offering that I can actually change that percentage? I think right now it's worded in six months after the end of the offering. That's just for doing another raise. Right, that's for another exam for another offering. Uh, I think the question, which I actually don't know the answer to, is how soon after I close my race can I actually become a non-Oregon business? Yeah, I'd have to look at that. Uh, roll one for yeah, actually, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's a window of time of about six months. Because what you need to do is you're going to need to find when you go out and you try to, you know, get the next. Another exemption, and again, you have to look at the federal and at the state level. And if you're going to go away from that um, interstate federal, then you're going to have to find a federal exemption. So, and that exemption is going to look back at least six months and see what you've done. Otherwise, it'll integrate the two, and you'll have to six find. Six months prior. Exemption. I mean, six months after essentially means six months prior to the next one. So the six month window is on both sides. And in between there, you probably ought to be talking to a banker or somebody like Alex to see if the company has moved into that bankable realm yet. And you can get halfway through your raise and get a bank loan, right? So the, the idea is that there, this is like this little moment right here, these sort of creative ideas is, oh, maybe bankers will be looking at these sorts of things and saying, well, if you can raise this much from a community, then come back to us, you know. So there, those sorts of things I think are going to, those conversations will happen. I think that's also the hope. 
So have you thought of this being kind of a segue into larger investments? So if I went out and got 50 investors and you know, raised $50,000, and but I can only put $2,000 in per investor, but I have this um, friends and family close network now of, uh, um, of so now can I then, or I don't have to have a public solicitation, but I can use them six months down the road. Now I want to raise $3 million, and now I can utilize those investors without being under the securities laws for general solicitation and be able to raise some additional funding that way. You're still under the securities laws. Well, that's true. <laughs> yes, but you, have, but you have a different exemption, potentially. There's an exemption for a pro rata offering. So if you offer to everyone you already have, yeah, that's a pro rata, and that, there's an exemption for that. But it's yeah. right now. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus points. Amy, you just said something about a bank loan. Um, these are not mutual. So what if the, the issuer, the company, decides to issue stock? That, that does not preclude them also from getting a bank loan, does it? No, because bank loans aren't securities. Right. They're fully collateral. Okay, so they can... They can do both. You could do a Kickstarter campaign, a key visit. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it because you have to disclose all of this stuff right. and you keep people apprised as you're getting all these, you know, your incomes, and your, your bank statements changing. It's very fluid, okay. which would make an investor nervous, potentially. Uh, so, uh, but, but, you know, if they're not securities, they're not, I mean, they're not, they're not securities, they're not regulated, they're not, um, you're not layering exemptions, which is not allowed. Okay, so just to make sure I'm clear, you can in fact have this raise going on in the state, raising money from individuals, and you can also be raising money from venture capitalists or some other sort of no. exterior. No, because venture capital would be a financial raise, you'd be using an exemption. But a bank, it, they're securities. Bank loans aren't securities. Kickstarter isn't a security. That's why those things kind of like, they don't count in this world. But you could six months later. Yeah. I don't want to confuse things. What? They're, I don't want to confuse things, but yeah. you can't, you can, um, the word is integration. You can't have offerings that get integrated because then the exemptions will layer. But you could design offerings that don't integrate. But you better get a lawyer to help you do that. But <laughs> it is possible. It, it's a little difficult. It's possible. If you have a different type of security you're offering and you're doing it for the, the raise for a whole different purpose, um, you can argue, you know, based on the specific facts of that situation, that maybe it doesn't integrate. So this, you know, what, what Lori said about just one more thing in the toolkit is really, you know, the perspective that we take. You know, all money is not created equal, right? And it's not all the right money for the right kind of entrepreneur. And uh, I think this is an exciting opportunity, and of course it's not for everyone. And it's, it, it, it's much simpler to get a couple of investors, and that's likely what co companies will go do. Um, but this is exciting. Um, it's new, it's, it's really relevant, I think, to rural communities who have long not had a lot of access to angel money or venture capital, um, you know, anyone in Oregon. So that's, you know, it's kind of, it reminds me of sort of the old, old school, like, farm raising. Hey, the, you know, we need, we need this as a community. Someone who's willing to do it, let's, let's help them do it. So it's, uh, it's an exciting thing. I'm really glad you're all here. And, if there's no other questions for Lori, I can let her off the hook um, from being on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so when are you coming to do your workshop, Lori? What's the security? Who cares? Well, I'll have care. to talk to Heather about that again. All in favor? I think you have a full house. You do? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I do. Before the snow flies, then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, see how smart you are? Two hours and you're all brilliant. Your minds are working. You've got all kinds of ideas.
We're thinking about what's going to work, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give a few of you who are, I can tell are kind of nerdy on right now. It's coming down a little long. She's the room. I know it gets worse. I'm with her. <laughs> You're smart. Appreciate the nerd. Right? Right. I, this is actually from, again, super, my guess is these things will be present. Just so you know, that's that. It okay. is the disclosure. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. I have one of those because I have a nerdy friend. Well, <laughs> so, everything. what this is, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a tad hesitant. Uh, but now that I'm going to describe it, you're all going to want one. But basically what this is, is um, this is part of the rules. So it's four and a half pages. This is the section of the rules that describe the disclosures that are required and the public advertising that's allowable. This may change. But it's an example of what will probably be true. You want to make Do not share these. <laughs> Eat them when you get home. So that you know, They're just a kind of an interesting, I don't know if you guys want to take a peek at this. So if you just take a look at it, you, oops, sorry. No, I got one here. Um, Question. Oh, question. Go ahead. Yeah. And I enjoy that too. But thank you. Uh -oh. oh, here's. <laughs> oh. So just just to clarify, uh, we're a company. We don't. We're not a brick and mortar. We make products. We uh, sell at events, and we also have a web presence. And because of a our relationship with the national uh, national shopping network, we are expecting our our web presence to really be the growing part of our business. It sounds to me like this is not the kind of uh, funding that we should really be looking at if we're expecting our internet business to Exceed grow. Exceed 20%. Yeah, wow. Yep. Okay, thank you. I know, I, ter I have had, That's I've had too bad. exactly like you <laughs> argue with me quite a bit about couldn't I just change the rule? <laughs> well, it is you know, I feel like I've kind of accomplished a lot, you know, yeah. for an next fourth grade teacher. Yes. But I can't change that. That part is gonna is really relevant to me. The mothership. But this is this is an awesome program for somebody not like us, and, and I really like appreciate. Year ago. Uh, yeah, six yeah, months ago. Six right? months ago, we're here. Yeah. But we really appreciate all the effort that's gone into this, and and you're working with these people in Salem to, <laughs> to get this through. So thank you very much. And I know it's, we have friends that I think are going to benefit greatly from this. I think uh, just something to say about um, the people who, per, who were perceived to be barriers, right? I was told, do not go talk to them. Hmm. And I, I said to them after an hour and a half, I said, you know what, you guys? This is going to be the best thing you ever did in your whole career. And they looked at me, kind of laughed, and then they looked at me, and, and the guy, you know, the director, he said, you know, you made the right. And I just, I have to say, I've been really impressed. It's been kind of a, a touching sort of honor to see how people will see the possibility, right, that, that this really is an opportunity. So um, it could be a disaster. I'm hoping it will. Thank you. If, if, just a quick question. If somebody had a, a scenario like you're just describing, is it possible to divide their business into segments and possibly yeah. still take advantage of this for a portion of their business? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Good question. We, could, we could do this like all day. We get all over the pubs and think of ways of working around the law. No, no, um, that's not working around the law. Well, it's, just, it, it, it's a real concern. They have an internet business and then they have a, a brick and mortar business. Yes. So I was uh, surprised. So I asked those two questions. One, what if you're an Oregon winery and you sell all your Oregon wine to an Oregon distributor? Because if anybody's paying any attention, the Oregon distributor, let me just say that again, Oregon distributors, uh, buy all the product and then they sell it to outside of the state. And I thought, that is not the spirit of the law. She said, it's fine. Like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Now, what if you're a company that's in the uh, Western states and you're starting a new, uh, you, you want to use this law, and so you're going to create a spin-off, a subsidiary, so you can take advantage of this law. And she said, 
I don't know that we would be happy with that. Uh, it would depend. So um, I think that the uh, subsidiaries uh, breaking off and doing new companies, reasoning for that would be looked at, uh, again, even though we're looking at them, you would be encouraged to have it be for um, something that makes sense. But there's a really good reason why you really want to focus on Oregon. Some particular part of your business is really Oregon specific, and you split off and you do a, a different kind of company. 